So um, for those that have been around the Stubif network for a while, you've probably sick hearing about the UK's portal and data and things. And this, this gives a, a very, I spotted this project a couple of months ago, and it gives a very different perspective and sort of um, emphasizes a lot of the points that we, we heard in the discussion yesterday. So um, I'm just going to run through a little bit of the, the, the sort of policy context around um, these overseas territories. Um, say a little bit about what's happening within them at the moment. Um, uh, and then talk about a project that was run within the UK, this, this um, uh, astoptic exercise effectively to, 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 to pull together what we know about them. And then I'm going to try and relate that back to what lessons we get out of this, um, um, certainly from the UK's perspective, but also more generally, I think, in terms of what it means for GBIF. And, and this sort of feels a bit like someone has come in and pressed the reset button on the UK, except that now we've got GBIF there, and it's kind of saying, so hi, well, let's, if we were running our process again, then, then what sort of lessons do we get out of it? So um, the, the, the UK has 14 of these overseas territories. I, I sat down for breakfast this morning with uh, John LaSalle, and he started getting very edgy when he heard the topic of my, of my um, uh, uh, presentation. It obviously does not include Australia. Um, uh, uh, and, um, but, but they're kind of, they're, they're generally um, very small islands. Um, they vary a lot in terms of, they're, they're scattered across the globe. Um, they are, some are in, not habited, um, uh, um, but um, uh, 11 of them are, and the, the, the populations vary a lot. So, um, but critically, or the most important element is from a biodiversity perspective, they are very important. So, so there are a lot of endemic species uh, within these islands that, that don't occur any, anywhere else. So, so hence there is a, a pretty serious um, uh, biodiversity in, interest here. Now, the, the policy framework, so, so there is a, a, what we call a, a white paper in, in, in the UK that sort of sets out our, our policy in, in this area um, for the overseas territories. And this basically gives the, um, the, 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 the governments within the territories the sort of uh, the overall responsibility for um, conserving their biodiversity and for developing environmental policies to support that. And, and the role of the UK government um, is, is very much around provision of um, advice and expertise. So, so this, if we kind of relate it back to GBIF again, this is, this is basically the, the, the sort of mentoring activities that um, GBIF has, has been running. It's saying the UK will provide a mentoring role, and, um, and, but, but that the, the, the territories themselves are responsible for the actual decisions and what happens. Um, and uh, there's also a kind of um, a strategy, an, an overarching strategy for the conservation and of um, uh, or sustainable use of biodiversity within those overseas territories, which has got five strategic priorities. One of which is specifically um, around data. So it's recognising right up front that actually knowledge of what you've got, where it is, is going to be fundamental to to actually managing what what you've got. So um, there are uh, a number. So we have we have you know, we're not coming in completely cold. So 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 there has been a number of initiatives within these overseas territories um, uh, that have had mixed success. It has to be said. Um, uh, there have been there have been sort of initiatives within specific territories and and sort of attempts to work across them. Um, uh, but there have been problems, as I say. So, so actually maintaining the capability within, so, you know, and I, I'm quite, sh well, I'm, I'm certain, in fact, that this is a problem in, in a number of other uh, GBIF participants as well. You run, you know, you, you, you've barely got enough resources to keep the thing going. As soon as you lose one person, you've really lost, a kind of, you've, you've lost a massive amount of, of the, the sort of capacity that you've got within your, your, uh, your node. Um, and also, we haven't really got a common approach. So, so it's kind of like, it's, it's, and the, the advantage of a common approach is it's probably a bit easier to keep the thing going. So I think the, the, the ultimate question here is, is there an opportunity for GBIF in this? Now, I, I, I have to say I was astonished by this. Uh, Tony, who will talk later, uh, um, yesterday in, in his little presentation, or, you know, um, was kind of saying, you know, back in the, in the late 90s, we were putting, and I was there as well, we not, not the, the, the same ones, but we were putting together databases 
of you know a couple of thousand, twenty thousand records, and kind of thinking we were doing pretty well. And, and that's obviously changed a lot over the last decade. But the thing that really amazed me was when I actually looked at what GBF had got for this tiny scattering of you know very small geographical areas. There was half a million records on GBF for for those. Now, like that, I, I, well, I, you know, you kind of know that, that you hear the numbers, of course, that the GBF's volume is going up. But actually, I was I was pretty surprised at the actual volume that was there. Um, intriguingly, 20% of that, so a fifth of the records available, were provided by the UK. So, and, and actually, if you look a little bit deeper than that, there's one, the uh, South Georgia and South, Sil South Sandwich Islands, um, where that's most of the UK data. If you take that out, it's actually only 3% of the data for the remaining overseas territories that are provided by the UK. So, so there's a really important message in this that actually... The, the global network, the, the, the fact that GBIF is global is actually contributing an enormous amount here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this, um, this stock tick of the overseas territories. So, so this was um, a piece of work that was funded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office and also supported by uh, one of our uh, non-governmental organisations, so the um, uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And it basically set out to... Um, to, to sort of describe slightly more definitively what is it that we've got within these overseas territories? Um, what do we know about it? What do we not know? What do we need to know? So it's kind of just an initial sort of audit of what, what have we got. Um, the, the approach, well, I, I think, so I think there's, there's kind of lessons in here as well, you know, and it may be that I feel like I'm running, I'm now running behind where an awful lot of people are in the room, which is uh, sort of an, an interesting experience, but, but I think it's worth describing the approach if there is anyone that happens to be even further behind than what we are here. Um, so th it was, it was a, a desk study, so it basically went back to things like Web of Science, Google Scholar, and GBIF, and sort of looked and said, okay, so what do we actually know? So what, 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 what literature is there out there? Um, that also sparked a set of, of people across the globe who knew something about them. Um, uh, and then you, can, you could go and you can phone them up and you can talk to them. Um, and then those contacts lead to other contacts and you kind of start building up um, uh, this network of, of people. And at the end of, of the day, um, uh, RSPB, so the, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, who actually did this work, let's be clear, this wasn't me, um, uh, they, they sort of pulled together about 600 um, scientific papers from and, and actually contacted about 100 individuals. Um, and they also used, you know, we've, we've heard it mentioned that this, this idea of, of the experts, they also used these experts to, um, to actually verify what they had got. Um, and, and I think the, the other interesting thing just down here, so the cost of the project was about £40,000. That's actually, so I think that may sound a lot to some people. It sort of equates to about a full-time post in the UK for a year. So that's roughly the sort of scale of the task for looking across, you know, 14 of these um, geographical areas. Um, I think I'm, I'm just going to dwell slightly on, on these images, but not for very long. So, so this is a way that the RSPB devised to actually present the results that, that they had, and I think you know it's it's worth it's I think it's worth considering. So, so the, the the dark blue circle in the middle is is effectively sort of the, the size of that is showing the total number of species, and then they sort of spin out little uh, the light blue circles are sort of the size of those shows you roughly how many species you've got within a particular taxonomic group. The, the sort of shaded in circle down, down at the bottom, so inside the blue circle, shows um, the number of uh, those species that have undergone some kind of IUCN assessment. And then the red circle is going to give you an indication of, of how threatened or not they are. And, and this can sort of then sort of leads up, I'm not sure how well that shows up, but, but it sort of gives you a very quick visual representation for each um, overseas territory to sort of show roughly how many species, you know, what sort of status does the whole thing look like, how much of this has actually been, been assessed. So it's kind of, you know, I think it's quite a good way of, of uh, very quickly engaging people in terms of showing the gap between what you know and what you don't know and of what you know, how important is the stuff that you have. Um, 
just to, just to go very quickly onto the conclusions, I mean, uh, so so we they basically showed that you know um, at least uh, there's at least 1,500 endemic species um, within these overseas territories, and that compares with about 90 in the United uh, possibly Kingdom, um, uh, and um, uh, that much of this is threatened. So, so many of these species are threatened. Um, and only 9% of them have actually had their, uh, their global status assessed. And generally, uh, that, that there's actually very limited knowledge in terms of, um, how, of managing or, you know, of, of this biodiversity within the overseas territory. So, so there's no real surprises in here, but it is still quite nice, and it's quite nice to have a sort of very glossy report, I think, to sort of really get this onto the agenda. So I, I think just going through, I'm just going to go through now some, some of the lessons that, that we can kind of pull out from this. So this kind of stock take exercise, I, you know, and I, and I realize, you know, there are people in the room who are at various stages of doing this or have done it. Um, but I think this sort of basic understanding of what you've got and um, uh, its importance is a really fundamental start to anything. Um, and um, and it also then helps to start to set well what are what are what's the priorities going to be from here what are we going to do next and more critically as I said it really helps to raise the profile of the problem and I think you know that's that's a really important point to bear in mind as you're as you're trying to build support for getting something going here and getting investment then having having a report that that can be readily digested and understood and people can see why this is important is, is a, a very solid start. Um, the second thing is I, I, I can almost feel uh, I've had this debate with a number of people in the room around the, uh, um, the, the reluctance, shall we say, of the, some of the, the UK museums to digitize their specimens. And, and, and it now feels a bit like I'm kind of like in that club. So, uh, the, you know, as, as I said at the start of this, there's kind of 3% of the data on GBIF for the overseas territories, or for, for a lot of them, actually comes from the UK. There must be an enormous amount of specimen data within the UK museums that is not on GBIF. And, and I think um, the, 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 the answer that I always get when I have this debate with those museums is, We've got massive collections, and getting the budget together to digitize all of them is going to be almost impossible. And you also get, and if I turn up with a geography, they say, oh, well, we can't, we're not organized by geography, we're organized by taxonomy. Um, and, and I think one of the other ways that the stock tick really helps is because it really targets what it is that we want to know about. So you can actually then turn up and say, right, the species that we're really interested in are these. Is that possible? To digitize, so it kind of starts to make this this sort of I think what we've called in the past demand-driven data mobilization very very targeted. So I think that's quite useful. Um, I think the funding is also quite interesting here. I mean, um, uh, and, and I think we've we've started having some debates on it yesterday in in, in the plenary session. So so this work, as I said, was funded through the UK Foreign Office um, uh, and and also kind of supported by you know. Um, uh, uh, contributions effectively made by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, um, and and that's quite interesting because it's kind of it's I think this this development funding or this kind of um, uh, overseas capacity building I think that's a really I think we need to think very hard about that within GBIF. Um, we, we, there are or there are already examples of it. I'm not saying that this is the first one we've had. You know, particularly in France, we've had the SEP 2D, um, uh, but I think we need to think more about. How do we start to tap into some of these um, uh, foreign offices? And, and uh, it's just kind of a similar plea, I think, to what we've heard from other other people. But I think you know, I think we've all got a job to try and help to think how to tackle that. Um, I I want to highlight this taxonomy. This has been mentioned a couple of times as well. But but um, uh, one of the this was one of the real expenses in the project. So you can get data really quickly, um, and what. RSPB found was that they actually dropped a lot of the data within GBIF, so they did not use it in their assessments. And the reason was that the overhead of translating that from a series of old names that the species were just not recognized by anymore into the current taxonomy was too big an overhead to tackle within the time that they had. 
Um, and, and I also, there's very limited mechanisms at the moment, or I, I feel, maybe I'm being overly critical, but I can't see how they work, of whenever you figure out that uh, a name is actually a name of another species, um, how does that get captured? So I know that, and I know it within my data set, but how does that information get captured and reused by other, other people? And I think, you know, this is, this is definitely something, I think it goes back to something that Donald was saying earlier and, and is in the work plan for next year, I think this is something that we really need to think about, how we get, how we get better. Um, and sort of allied to that, I, I think, you know, and again, it's kind of, it's in the work plan, but I guess I'm just supporting it as being this is where we need to go next, you know. So the actual volume of data that's available here is very impressive. But, you know, we, we do know that there are issues around quality, um, and we do know that, you know, as I've just said, around the taxonomy. And I think being able to interact with those data a lot more so that you can you can flag things against the record and say, this is not known by this species anymore, it's known by this. Um, uh, and how to get that information, as Donald was saying, fed into the right sort of um, taxonomic aggregators, I think that's another thing that we really, really have to tackle to make this, to make this more, more useful. Um, the, the expert networks were, were also, so they were a critical part of what RSPB did. So, so they, they didn't, you know, there was basically um, one person kind of more or less sat in the middle of this, who is not an expert in all of the overseas territories, nor in all of the taxonomic groups. And basically building this network is very important. Um, and, and I was just wondering about, you know, to, to what extent are we sharing, do, do other people have those kind of expert networks and are we sharing them? So, you know, we've focused very much on building technical networks within GBIF, but I do wonder about how we actually start to build these network of experts. And I was also caught by one of the, in, when I was preparing this presentation, I was caught by this comment that came back from RSPB that was, there is no better way to prompt a response than to give someone something that they can point out errors in. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And, and I think, you know, you can sort of go and ask for help and you will get nothing. As soon as you put something on someone's desk that they can p pick up a hole in, then you will get a response. So I think that, that is, I think not aiming for perfection and just getting something out is, is another important way to actually engage that, that network. Um, building the local capacity is, um, uh, or the, the local capability. And I think, um, I, I'm not sure that we got this quite right actually in, in the project. I think there's a bit more to do there and I think that's in, in our next steps. But it is really important to kind of, that people don't feel this is being done to them but actually they feel that they are part of what is being done. And I think that's something that is just worth bearing in mind as we you know, run more of these projects. And again, I know I'm preaching very much to the converted around the room, but I think it's, it's again just worth reiterating some, some of these um, messages. So I, I think those are some of the main things that came out. Um, I think uh, the next steps are, you know, we want to get these data published now and also properly repatriated to the overseas territories. Um, I'm also very interested, you know, so we've, we've got the Atlas of Living Australia and we, we've had a strand of work within the, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, engagement or, you know, hel helped by the uh, GBIF Secretariat to, to, to look at can we actually turn something like the Atlas of Living Australia into a, a more reusable portal. And, you know, uh, we, we've got a meeting coming up with um, uh, Peter from the Atlas of um, Living Australia, and I think I'm really interested in can we actually use that as a solution within the, the UK overseas territories as we try to get more of a, a repatriation of these data. Um, the stock take is not perfect, so, so there's a lot of refinement that needs to be done there, and again, that's about engaging um, uh, the overseas territories themselves. Uh, and then also, I think what the, the real goal, you know, it's kind of, it's very nice sort of hearing uh, Liam presenting a lot of the things that, you know, within the UK, that's, that's sort of how things are working. You know, it's, it's how do we use these data to help with planning? And, and I think the question now is kind of, that's where we want to fairly rapidly try and get the overseas territories to start thinking. So what are the other data sets that they need? How can we make best use of what else is around? And how can we integrate these data into that to start to give them a system that can really help with planning? And also this kind of, th this sort of building the capability within those people. And I think that again needs, you know, it needs a bit of thinking about what the strategy is there so that it becomes a more sustainable thing. So 
there is there is a pilot um, uh, there is a, a pilot project looking at um, certainly across the South Atlantic um, where it's trying to look at you know the, the people the data and the systems and how we can bring that lot together to sort of create a sustainable um, uh, um, infrastructure uh, that, that can actually help to, to drive this forward so a quick summary um, the stock take, or this, this sort of audit or stock take of what you've got, I think is a really useful tool. I've seen it here. I've even seen it within the UK at sort of more local levels. People will start with an audit of what they've got to actually frame what's important to then drive the investment and what the next steps are. And it, it probably isn't, you know, I can say it's not expensive. It, it, it costs about a year of staff time, as I say, and, and I think that's, that's money, that's investment very well spent. Um, GBIF did really help here, so I think you know the actual volume of data is very impressive. Um, uh, there was some very useful functionality around, you know, the the, the 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 country pages and things. You know, are actually very very useful. So it's quite nice that some of these things that you've sort of been involved in coming back and actually really helping with a problem that that um, uh, you're facing. Um, the fact that um, GBIF can now publish other materials, so, you know, richer data, so we've kind of mentioned um, uh, images, so her herbaria um, Im images and things, I think is also going to be quite useful now as we start to take this forward and start to try and consolidate what we have within the UK and elsewhere in, into something. And then again, th th this sort of reuse of the Atlas of Living Australia, I really like the idea of that purely because it's kind of showing how you know, a global community can actually really start working together to, 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 to sort of get a real gain there. So I'm quite interested in that. The engagement of the experts is critical, and I think it is, you know, I think it's interesting that it's, I hadn't realised it was in um, uh, the Jeep of Secretariat sites, but I think that is a really important element now that we need to start thinking about. And, and as I say, I think, you know, I think um, I'm not, these aren't new things, but I think I'm just reiterating the importance of them in terms of what I've seen. That this making, this beginning to get the data on GBIF more, that you can interact with it more, that you, it's not just something that's sat there that you can't touch, but actually you can start putting information against it and say, look, there's a problem here. Um, uh, and also, I think these, these taxonomic services, I think, you know, you, you look in the marine area and it is, it's, it's very, very nice. It's kind of, there, there's a, Mark Costello isn't here, I don't think, but the the, um, the the World Register of Marine Species, I think the marine area worked well here. That 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 resource, that service around it is brilliant. And I think it is trying to get some of these other taxonomic services to that same kind of level will actually really help to lever the power of the data that are in GBIF. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? Over here. Thank you, Sue. I think that was a very, very interesting presentation uh, in that shows how even countries like the UK, which is a leader in terms of natural history collections and also a developed country, can still make use of GBIF data in a way that uh, otherwise you couldn't have done this stock take. Uh, but you made a remark, which I have to make a comment on that remark. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of these self-fulfilling prophecies. Because you said it's, uh, our collections are so massive that it's going to be impossible to digitize. Well, the first time I, I read that, that almost exact uh, meaning in words was in 1992, done by someone in Australia that said that it was impossible to digitize the collections. Well, it's impossible if you don't try. And I think that... Uh, even if there are 100 million specimens, even if there are 500 million specimens, we know how much every specimen takes to be digitized. It's a matter of money and of willingness. So I see that it's very difficult, I can, I can imagine, and that they are taxonomically organized and all that. When Mexico wanted the data from the British collections, we have to go cabinet by cabinet, not computerizing the Costa Rican specimens, the Nicaraguan specimens, the Honduran specimens, because we were told you are allowed to do it just for Mexico. And, and that kind of mentality <laughs> makes impossible to do things that are fairly feasible and, and possible. And it's just a remark. I'm not picking on you. No, 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 no I, uh, or, or, hey, you're, you're not. You're, it's not. So I think if, if I said... I, 
if I reflected a view that was it is impossible to do, it is not my view. Um, so I would fully support what you say. It is an achievable thing. Um, I, I can say that at least um, you know the, the museums are making the right sorts of noises now. Um, uh, but I guess this is just adding a bit of weight to say, look, you know, so I, I'm I'm completely, you know, I, I feel frustrated because I'm the one caught in the middle of these. We don't have the big museum sitting in the room and I'm the one that has to keep going back and kind of saying, come on, guys, it's kind of like it's embarrassing. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm completely on the same page as, as you there. It's not impossible. I completely agree. Question over there. Uh, yeah, Donald Hoban, uh, Executive Secretary of Geo. Just, just, just one comment uh, on the UK museums. I was actually visiting the Natural History Museum about two weeks ago, and it was very exciting to see that they are very close now to having a data portal up. Uh, and I know that they are currently in a program to digitize not all of their specimens, but a good chunk. Uh, and so I think we will start seeing a lot more visibility, at least from that institution, in the very near future. So. Watch out for it. I'm, I'm excited too. I'm excited too. Okay, we have a, a question here and a question here. Um, and um, one more from Jean. And I think um, if we take those three... Yeah, uh, that's fine. Perhaps if we could take the, the three together, if that's possible. And then you I'll do my best. Them, yeah, go on then. Try and remember them. Right, More go. efficient use of time. <laughs> okay. First, I do agree with what Jorge said completely. It's, it's just a pity to have those animals there and not been able to, <laughs> to, digitize, or to digitize them partially. On this stock take that you have uh, proposed as approach, uh, the taxonomic focus on digitizing down, down only those specimens which are important because the collections are already taxonomically organized, which is really sound and good. I, I support that. However, I also fear that that might introduce a bias. Um, for example, if you concentrate on those important specimens, which quite often would be, would be those conservation-related specimens, yeah. uh, such as uh, red-listed or something like that, that might, especially for small regions, uh, artificially increase the risk or biodiversity risk of those regions because you have a higher percentage of important specimens because the baseline of other specimens is reduced because they have not been digitized. So yeah. by digitizing only what is stock important, what we risk is to attribute undue, undue uh, importance to those areas because we lack the baseline. Yeah. However, the catch is that to get the baseline, we need to digitize geographically, which is what is very yeah, difficult, yeah. as you say, very difficult to do in a taxonomically oriented collection. Okay. So is there any solution to this conundrum? Mm, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll take. I'll take the. Who's who's the second question over there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm, I'm going to respond to all three together. All, all three at once. Up questions. Oh, Sorry, I can answer that one immediately. So that's exactly right. So, 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 yeah, so that one's that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, and then um, fi and final Jean. question from Jean. Yes, sir. you talk about uh, data repatriation. I was uh, really yeah. surprised because it's not common for the North countries to talk about data repatriation. Can you tell <laughs> more about this? Oh, well, that's harsh, Jean. That's harsh. Um, I, I, I think, I think. So, um, to, to take the first question, then. So, I think. 
I mean, you, of course, you are right. I mean, it is it is creating a bias. Um, I think we're kind of sitting in a scenario where we have to be pragmatic about what resources we've actually got. And I think it is, you know, within very limited resources, how do you target them? Of course, the perfect solution is a com more complete digitization of the collections. Um, and, and I guess all that we're really doing is kind of using the digitization that's gone on elsewhere as a bit of a proxy for where we target our own effort initially. Um, but, you know, as Donald says, you know, we're, we're not... That there is still this desire. This isn't the answer. This this sort of very very targeted digitization. That's not the answer, but it might be a short term answer. Um, and in terms of the repatriation, I I think um, I I think it really depends on what you mean by that. Really. So I I guess you know I I think here. So in terms of the collections, for for example, I think you know the top copy of the data probably always rest with the collection. In my head, you know, I think I think what I, what we're talking about here is data that can genuinely be be managed by and should be managed by the overseas territories. So things like what is the species list within your country and what are the status of each of those species. Now, so that's the sort of data that have been uh, put together by this piece of work, and and logically, the only place that that can sit is that that happens to have been done in. Uh, London or, or, or wherever it was, but actually, somebody needs to take o ownership of that, and and that's not going to happen within the UK, or it shouldn't happen. It's, it's certainly not the policy within the UK. So, so it's very logical there to say, look, these data ought to be managed and owned by those overseas territories. Okay. Thank you very much.